Hey guys, today we start a new book, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, the second letter of Corinthians was written less than a year after the letter of the 1 Corinthians. So, um, Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he goes to Ephesus, he actually comes back to Corinth, he goes back to Ephesus, uh, and then he goes on to Macedonia and he writes the letter um, to the Corinth church, the second letter back to the Corinth church. Um, but he writes this letter because there is an issue. This is not so much like a doctrinal issue or there's issues in the church in that um, in the time that he has been moving around less than a year, some false teachers have infiltrated the church and they've been preaching and teaching and basically saying that Paul was fickle. Um, Paul did not know what he was talking about. Paul didn't really mean what he said. And so when you say these types of things, they're not just hurting Paul, but they're hurting Paul's um, preaching. They're hurting Paul's teaching. So now the church is kind of like, did Paul mean this or did Paul mean that? And these false teachers are trying to lead the church away from Paul's teaching and back more to um, the false teachings that inhabited all of Corinth. So Paul writes this letter, and much of this letter is really kind of a defense of Paul, of himself. This is who he is. This is what he stands for. This is why God has called him. This is the gospel he's been preaching, and those types of things. So as we read this letter, it, it's kind of one of the most personal letters that Paul writes to any of the churches. It's almost kind of like we get to see the inside of Paul's heart and why he um, why he does what he does, what he feels when God has called him, and the, the ultimate truth behind the message of what he is preaching, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. And so he's writing this letter back to the Corinth church to help them set straight because there is some false teachers in the church, okay? So as we begin chapter one, once again, it's the beginning of a letter. So we kind of see an intro um, that just says, hey, this is from Paul. This is what's going on. God is going to comfort you as God has comforted me, even in some hard times. And then in verse eight, um, we see, um, we kind of get into some of Paul's troubles and we'll continue to kind of get some specifics on Paul's troubles uh, as we read through the letter of 2 Corinthians. But we know um, that he has faced wild beasts in Ephesus. There's a riot. There's people against him. Um, he's gone to court. He's had uh, lashings. Um, so all these types of things have gone on. Right, and you can pick these up in the book of Acts, um, chapter end of 18, 19, and 20. Um, so all these things happen. Paul's having some troubles, but then in verse 12, we can see where Paul starts to defend himself. Okay, um, for our boast is this that the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and so supremely so toward you. Paul simply starts off and says, everything we've done has been nice, it's been good, it's to make you better, and it, everything has been for the glory of God. And that's exactly what Paul has done. That's what the whole first letter of 1 Corinthians was, right? Telling them to, no matter what they do, do it for the glory of God. And so Paul starts his argument and says, everything that we have done, we have done it for the glory of God. But in verse 18, we, we see the real accusation. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no right? In verse 17, above it, it says, do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? These false teachers have told the church um, that Paul is fickle. He's willy-nilly, right? He says, 
hey, you should do this, but then he's telling somebody else they should do that. And he could go here, he could go there. It's just really, Paul's not that important. He's not that big of a deal. Um, and so basically they're saying his word is not true. Paul has no idea his yes could mean yes and it could mean no. It just depends on who it's talking to, right? So they're tearing him down personally, but as they're tearing him down personally, they're tearing apart his word. And his word is what is taught the Corinthian church. Remember, they don't have the New Testament. So everything that they know about the gospel is because of Paul, right? It's the word of Paul. So if they can tear down Paul, then they can tear down the word of Paul, which means they won't believe in the gospel. And the gospel will not go forward and it will not bring glory to God, right? So Paul simply makes a defense and he says, my yes has been yes and my no has been no. I, I don't waver back, to, back and forth. And he continues on in verse 19 and he says that they're based um, on wrong spiritual reasons, right? He, go, he goes on and says, for the son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we've proclaimed to you, um, I was... Um, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes, for the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for glory. So Paul says, in everything we've done has been for Jesus, and Jesus is always yes and yes. And so if we are proclaiming Jesus, you don't have to believe the word of Paul you have to believe the word of Jesus. And Jesus is always, his yes means yes and his no means no. So um, everything that Paul said to the Corinth church was always about Jesus. It was never about himself. And so they should be able to get through these false teachers pretty quickly on what they're saying. In verse 23, we see uh, at the end of this chapter, it says, but I call, Paul calls, God to witness against me. This is a serious oath. This is Paul basically coming out and saying, I swear on God's name. God can look through me. He can look through my heart. He can look through my words and he can tell me if it was right or wrong. And he can tell you if it was right and wrong, right? So here Paul is saying, I call God to be my witness. It was to spare you that I refrain from coming again to Corinth. This idea, he says, I didn't come to you because I wanted to spare you. It, we, we see a moment of Paul, of him saying, you're lucky I did not come to Corinth, right? Because these false teachers are probably saying that, oh, see, he won't even come back to Corinth. He left you and he won't come back because he knows he's fickle. He doesn't know where he's going. And Paul writes and says, you're lucky I'm not coming back because if I was coming back, I'd be coming back, in, but I'm not coming back because it's to spare you. Paul says, if I was there, I would get you, right? I, we would, we'd have a theological showdown, right? And so he says, it was to spare you that I refrain from coming to Corinth, verse 24, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for our joy and for you stand firm in the faith. Paul says, you're lucky I didn't come, but he says, but not that we lord over the faith. Paul is not over the church. He's not over faith. Jesus is over faith, right? Paul says, so you're lucky I didn't come, but it's not that I'm over faith, but it's that I'm a co-worker with you. I'm a, I'm a co-worker that we work together. And when we work together for God, that's supposed to bring joy. Um, for you stand firm in your faith. And so basically, Paul is just quickly saying here in this first chapter that everything he's done is for Jesus. Everything that he said is for Jesus. And everything that he is working for is for Jesus. And so here he's talking to the church and the false teachers that have infiltrated the church. And he says, who are you working for? Who are you talking about? What do you care about, right? He's saying everything I've done is for Jesus. Everything you're doing is for your own benefit, for people to follow you. You want to pull people away from Jesus so they would follow you. It's all about you personally, but nothing was for Paul. Nothing was for him personally. It was all for Jesus. So I hope that makes sense in setting up this book of 2 Corinthians. It's really an attack on Paul, 
but because it's attack on Paul, it's an attack on his words, okay? And so Paul must defend himself so that he can defend the words of Jesus because his words are the scripture in which Corinth has, right? Because they don't have the gospel. They don't have the written New Testament yet. And so Paul must stand up for Jesus um, in Jesus's works, in Jesus's words, and in Jesus's actions. And that's what the rest of the book's about. So I hope that makes sense. And we will see you Monday in chapter two. God bless.